Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning. My name is Robert Sherrod. I'm here as the chair of the U-Mobile Working Group, and I'm here presenting today with Doug Johnson from the University of Florida. Um, a few months ago, Doug and I were talking about the conference, and we thought it would be really good to give people attending the conference a, a feel of what's happening in terms of mobile across the whole of Herio Peace. So what we're going to be doing today is a couple of talks within one, so you get two for the price of one. Doug's going to be talking about the Kitai project at the University of Florida. I'm usually loud enough anyway. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the U-Mobile project which has been going on over the last couple of years. I think it's important to give you all here a chance to understand some of the options and some of the opportunities you might have around providing mobile serv services on your campus. Okay, so we're going to start. I'm going to hand over to Doug, who's going to talk through the five. No problem. And I'm sure the bottom line is simply that the fact that both the Sakai community and the Jason community bring mobile initiatives to the table really reinforces what we already know, and that is that mobile is increasingly important um, in a variety of different ways. Um, so we had these two key pro mobile projects um, that have come together to do today's presentation. So. I'm going to talk about Project Kaitai and what's been happening with Mobile Sakai. Um, don't attempt to write this URL down, just be aware of the fact that it is um, uh, going to be in the recorded uh, stream of the presentation so you can catch this later. Um, but this has this is the website uh, for the Kaitai project and has all of the information that I'm about to go flying past. Because I wanted to start with some background to bring everybody up to date with how this uh, Project Kaitai came about. Um, but I don't want to spend much time on this because ultimately it's not what happened in the past, but what's happening now that's most important. So the whole idea of Project High Tech started with a conversation involving Cambridge, Florida, Indiana, and Oxford starting in about January of 2011. And in the summer of 2011, these institutions had put together a formal proposal to the community, the Sakai community, to create a mobile project. Um, so having done all this wonderful work, having framed out and scoped out a project, um, coming up with a good proposal work stalled um, because, of course, we were all dealing with various economic issues of funding cuts and budget cuts and staffing cuts and everything else that was going on. So last summer I had what I would call my slip my wrists uh, presentation at the first Jason Sakai conference where I basically came before the community and said, look, nothing's been happening, things have been stalled and I have no clue how to move things forward. Um, uh, and so a couple of things came out of that. One was I had arranged for a four-hour block of time to be a programming marathon, but because of the budget issues, nobody brought any programmers uh, that could work on this mobile initiative. So I had four hours of time with nobody to use it with. And out of that uh, came a suggestion from the group that attended the presentation that we have a use case of thought, um, as it was called, which is just an opportunity for anybody from the community to come and talk about their interest in a mobilized Sakai and what they would want to do with a mobile Sakai. It was a fantastic four hours of people just nonstop flowing by to brainstorm um, about what they would want to do. Faculty members, uh, students, um, developers, uh, administrators, what their visions were for mobile out there institutions. It was a great session. And then another conversation that was independent of that uh, brought up the idea of my, as the, you know, as the leader of the project Kaitai, which didn't have the name Kaitai at this time, um, moving away from trying to conscript volunteer programmers, but instead shifted to fundraising mode um, and come up with some money to hire uh, contract programmers to work on this project. So um, deciding to run with that, I went to uh, my boss, who's the associate CIO, um, and said, look, I'm about to go into fundraising mode. It would be really embarrassing for me to go out and ask other institutions to cough up money and have somebody say, how much is the University of Florida putting on the table? And not have a response. So how much is the University of Florida willing to put on the table? So my boss went to the CIO and the CIO said, well look, mobile is important to us, 50,000 bucks is pretty reasonable, that was the estimated cost of the project, we'll pay it. So in one conversation my fundraising was done. <laughs> <laughs> so it was brilliant, it was, it, was, it was wonderful, but of course this has also reflected the fact of, of a wonderful timing, totally accidental, that the University of Florida was launching a big mobile initiative and so this was an obvious piece to play in that larger mobile initiative. So having now a bucket of money to work with, um, I sat out uh, conscripting volunteers to serve as a steering committee as we worked to turn this into an official project of the Sakai Foundation. These institutions and organizations agreed to participate and became the steering committee. I wanted to recognize them and thank them for their advice as we've moved along. 
Um, and then the wonderful thing in the way timing works, we ran into, again, more problems that slowed things down, and that was, of course, the merger of the Sakai Foundation and the uh, JSIG organization to form the Imperial Foundation. And it turned out that there were a bunch of legal issues that involved with, that were involved with the University of Florida donating money to this new Imperial organization with a specific purpose that that money needed to be spent on. And all of those legal issues, legal issues had to be addressed. So you get lawyers involved and everything slows down. And plus the words get much bigger and much more complicated and very interesting. Um, but the bottom line, we worked out all the details and Project Kaitai was officially launched in February 2013. It had four major goals, to improve the entity broker support for communication and any broker of course in Sakai serves as a mediator for passing information um, across the system and outside of the system. To enhance core and some contrib tools to enable mobile interaction, to contribute all code that was developed under this project back to uh, the Sakai trunk, specifically targeting Sakai 2.10 with the intent to backport into 2.9, and then to evaluate and maintain uh, the submitted code for the future, uh, future releases 2.11 and beyond. So Project Kaitai was underway. Um, now, at this point, I need to point out that it's very important to remember with Project Kaitai, we're talking about mobilizing Sakai. We are not talking about creating mobile apps. One of the big issues that had come out of the early discussions around mobilizing the course management system, um, for example, was testing. Under what circumstances did you want to uh, enable testing on mobile devices? And there were some institutions that felt very strongly that they would not want to they would not want to mobilize testing because of all the security uh, issues associated with that, the loss of control of location and identity and other types of things. While other institutions said that we wanted to enable everything and to leave it to uh, individual instructors to deal with those issues of when a mobile test would be appropriate and when a mobile test might not be appropriate. Um, so there were all kinds of nifty uh, issues associated with what tools should be mobilized and the recognition that there was going to be differences of opinions across organizations and oftentimes even across colleges and programs within a particular institution. So the focus of Project Kaitai was to build into Sakai the mobile hooks that would enable an institution to take its mobile app, whether it was a device-specific app, a native app for iPhone or Android or Blackboy, Blackboard or Blackboard, uh, Blackberry, excuse me, I'll get there eventually. It was over here in the conversation about Blackboard before this presentation began, that programming thing. And, um, uh, and then also, of course, would enable institutions to determine which tools they would enable in their mobile app, uh, in whatever framework they wanted to work that mobile app. So it's important to recognize that Project Kaitai is not creating the mobile app. It's creating the mobile capabilities in Sakai. I decided to go with Steve Swinsburg and Flying Kite um, out of Australia. Um, uh, as most of you know, they're familiar with the Sakai Foundation. Steve Swinsburg has deep uh, connections to the programming part of the Sakai world, and so he was an obvious uh, choice for me to work with. And so we set up a timeline. And the bottom line in this timeline is that we were shooting to have the code piece wrapped up by the end of December of this year, December 2013. Um, a couple of more complex tools would bleed into 2014, but the primary programming work would be done by the end of this calendar year. So the bottom line, where are we right now in June 2013? Well, as you can see here, many of the tools in the course management system in Sakai CLE are already completed. The code has been reviewed, the code has been submitted, um, and now is now available um, uh, for use. We have a number of other tools um, uh, where the code writing is completed, and the, they're simply awaiting the final code review before that code is submitted. Um, where it can then be downloaded and um, uh, installed on local instances of Sakai to mobilize those particular tools in a, in a tool at a time um, uh, capability. The interesting piece, of course, is that this reflects the vast majority of the programming of the different tools. Um, we're running way ahead of schedule in the programming piece of Project Kaitai is the bottom line here, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Work on the entity broker is not yet completed. Um, it is targeted to be completed by the end of July of this year. Um, the entity broker piece is primarily focused on, as you can see here, the serializers. And I should point out that I am not a programmer. This is wording that Steve uh, passed to me. Um, so I'm, I'm taking a moment here to speak in Greek. Um, 
though I've actually studied Greek and I can do that better than I can talk programming. But the objective, of course, ultimately is to make sure that the functional capabilities of a mobile available to Sakai are as quick and efficient as possible in, compu in communicating with mobile devices. One other contrib tool, there were a couple of contrib tools that we threw into the mix. The focus was, of course, the Sakai core tools um, for this uh, project. Um, but I did manage to throw in a couple of the contrib tools that reflect, quite frankly, contrib tools that are in use at the University of Florida. There is some advantage to being ones that are paying for the work. Um, and NIMI is one of those contrib tools that we do use at the University of Florida, and that's slated to uh, come up very shortly to begin work on by the end of July, by the end of June, exactly when its completion date. Don't know, but it'll probably be in July would be my estimate. We're coordinating with SAMU. I don't know if we have any representatives from SAMU uh, here today, but I wanted to publicly acknowledge them. Uh, as soon as Project Kaitai got up, they stepped up and said that they would be willing to donate 200 hours of programming time uh, to this project. And so they had been a part of working on a couple of the tools that have done uh, the entire work uh, load on a couple of the tools uh, as well. So what are we talking about? We're talking about project completion by the end of July, with the exception of NIMI. Um, this is very exciting. The other piece is that this includes work on OAuth, um, where Project Kaitai, Steve, and Flying Kite are working with Oxford University um, in getting that work done. The products of the Kaitai project, all of the products, that all of the pieces that have been reviewed, the code pieces have already been uploaded. They have been contributed. They are available. You can go to this directory, and you can see long service. You can see the, the list of web service endpoints. Steve has been tracking all of his work um, and documenting all of his work. Here's the, the JIRA point where you can get that information. Again, I would suggest that you try to write this down, go back and review uh, the presentation, um, and you'll be able to get this in a little bit more leisurely fashion. I've also just started a conversation because we're, we're, we're literally six months ahead of schedule um, uh, on this project. It's just extremely exciting. I just started a conversation with Neil Caden about the possibilities of taking all of this mobile code and rolling it into an upcoming point release um, for the Sakai CLE. We do not have a date, we do not have a time, we do not have a target, we do not have um, uh, any specific information about that except that that conversation is started. Um, so I would anticipate that at some point in the future, <coughs> again, no dates, um, uh, we will have a mobile enabled uh, Sakai 2.9 uh, patch or piece that we'll be able to roll out as part of the point release. There is a mobile listserv. If you go to the website that I cited back at the very beginning of the presentation, you can subscribe to the mobile listserv. I occasionally push out information to that list to keep people up to date on what's happening with Project Kaitai so you can continue uh, to get further updates as we wrap up this project and continue to build out a mobile enabled Sakai. So all code is committed to trunk. I'm duplicating slides here. Um, the bottom line, Project Kaitai is under budget, ahead of schedule, and nearing completion. Um, how often do you hear those words? Um, <laughs> you only work for the government. Yeah, you know, I couldn't possibly work for the government. That would immediately rule me out. Um, but the bottom line is that the code for all of the completed tools is available now. If your institution has a particular tool that you are um, particularly interested in mobilizing sooner rather than later, um, that code is available for all of those completed tools, and you can start doing that. In fact, I had a wonderful conversation yesterday with uh, the American Public School uh, University System, um, uh, where they have already started implementing some of that code and are providing some feedback to us um, about the user side experience and some gaps in the programming. It's important to recognize that as you download this code and begin to use this, the next step in all of this, of course, is user feedback. What's working, what's not working properly, um, what additional features, functions, and capabilities might um, uh, be employed in the context of this mobile environment. So we're very interested in having people begin to work with these, uh, with this code, with these code pieces, and begin to give us this feedback. We're looking forward to working with the American Public University on, on your feedback. So I have to acknowledge quickly thanks to Steve Swinsberg and Flying Kite to Oxford University Project Kite Tai Steering Committee, to Samu, um, to the University of Florida, to my boss's boss who uh, cut the check. Um, uh, and then, of course, also the institutions that were involved in this project from the very beginning, Cambridge, uh, Oxford, Indiana, Indiana um, and, and Michigan, that were very vital in bringing us to where we are now. So that's Project Kaitai in a nutshell. I'm going to turn things back over to Robert to talk about the JSIC mobile, and then we'll come back together for questions at the end. Thank you. <coughs> so you mobile. 
I think when we started to think about this a couple of years ago, we were really trying to understand what a mobile solution would look like. And we came across a number of scenarios a bit similar to the you were describing in the use case. A thon. Um, so, you know, we, we want to produce something that works with multiple audiences. It's got to work for a number of different scenarios across campus life. Some of this is going to be the practical stuff like when's the bus come in. Some of it might be more directly access to course information and other academic information. Um, equally with that, with that content, we want to enable creation of content and also acknowledge and recognize and work with the complexity of systems out there that we really need to integrate with to provide this mobile solution. Um, inevitably, as we move forward in the, the consumer-driven mobile world, we have to be able to work with multiple platforms as we do this. And there may be different levels. So for some people, it might be enough to provide a, a sort of a, a single view that everybody can see. But certainly a number of the schools who have worked with us around new mobile so far, there's a real drive and the need to provide that authenticated and personalized experience of the mobile. So uh, as the new mobile working group, we've been around the uh, block a number of times thinking about new mobile. And we actually, several times, we've come to a, a, an uncertainty about what your mobile actually is. But I think if we go back to the beginning, think about those factors that we just talked about in the previous slide, there's a realization that actually we really recognize that problem space was being described there. You know, JSIC has had U Portal as a project for 12, 13 years now that's been designed to fit those requirements. And what we've really, as a working group, finally, and it was actually yesterday afternoon, I think we all finally agreed on this, is that U Mobile is about the mobilization of the portal platform, the portal technology. So it's about the mobilization of U Portal. Um, significantly within this, it's got to be about flexibility of presentation. So what U Mobile offers is a, an app out of the box which works with iOS and works with Android. We provide a, a mobile friendly view via a browser. So if you're using a browser on a phone or a tablet device, you can use that. But it also, there's other opportunities in here. And we're starting to really explore and understand these. Some of the work that's been going on at Oakland University have done this. So maybe if there's a particular need you've got, you can develop your own interface for this. And also, I think you know, responsive design seems to be very much a, a buzzword and a bit of a catch at the, at the moment. But um, this does really provide some opportunities to start to slot in some of that responsive design to what you do. So you, as I said already, you mobile does build on JSIC's experience. You know, not just in terms of the product, but builds on the community. We've got a community of uh, nobody knows. Let's say hundreds of thousands of users of you portal, and certainly if we times that over the ten years you portal has been in use, we've got a huge amount of wealth and experience in our community. Um, we provide this robust, resilient, sophisticated framework that provides all of the features that we're looking for, and we know this scales massively should it need to. So that's sort of an insight into the problem area and what we're trying to deal with. In terms of actually practically acting upon something, uh, U-Mobile as a project started in March 2011. We've got a, a working group that's been drawing membership from across the JC community. We've got colleagues from institutions in North America, we've got myself from the United Kingdom, and we've also got colleagues from France from the ASA Portai Consortium. And as you, you may have heard, if you're not aware of, from, if you come from the Sakai side of the Perio, JSIC's had an incubation process in place for quite a long time, which is around ensuring that projects are mature enough to actually be fully sponsored JSIC projects. And one of the key things within that is that a number of schools have to be in production with that product to ensure that it graduates. So we were very pleased last October to announce to everybody in the community that JSIC uh, in mobile had gone through the JSIC incubation process and had actually graduated based on the work that had been done at Oakland, Ohio, and colleagues in France at the UPMC, Sorbonne, uh, Normandy, and La Rochelle. 
I think that the last slide, then I'll show very quickly some examples of view mobile in action. One of the other things we've learned over the last couple of years, and I know we always think of some technology, but this really is true in this situation. This area, play, this particular space, is moving incredibly fast. We're learning as a, as a working group, as a community in production. We're learning all the time. I think that's one of the keys to collaboration with QTI as well, is to ensure that we can share that learning effectively across us. And our working group continues to evolve. So we need to ensure that the different points of view, the different experiences are represented in that working group. There's a little plug. If you are interested particularly in your mobile, but in, in QTI as well, we're actually having project collaboration time tomorrow at 1 o'clock. We're going to have an hour and a half talking about you mobile and starting to map out the next step of what we do for the rest of this calendar year and into the next year. So please do come along and join us then. OK, so very quickly, some features of you mobile and how it's been used. So we've already said you mobile is native. It works in a number of web browsers. Um, some work that went on that uh, Wisconsin Madison was around looking at described to leave the portal and new mobile technology. So what they've done there is they've created a number of interfaces, particularly with a focus on grades. So you can see they've launched this through their Twitter stream, and I think they had a huge success. Jim, was that great? You had lots of, do you remember how many people were accessed the grades through? Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> really on the spot. And then one of the other, <coughs> Big successes has been Oakland University. So here we can see we'll just scroll, <coughs> scroll through a number of screenshots of um, what you see as the vanilla interface, then what you see when you log in, and then use the use of CAS for the single sign on. Some of the portals from the JSON community that are used in, in a lot of institutional portals are also being used in that particular mobile app and mobile view. And just finally, there you can see we've had some, Oakland have had some great feedback from students who have actually used the app once it's been downloaded and they've had time to play with it and experiment with it. Okay, so that's very quickly through <coughs> your mobile. As I said, we're both continuing to develop this projects. Um, we are working together. Doug is a member of the U Mobile working group. He joins our calls. We're looking for any other ways that we can share that learning and collaborate together. Um, one other thing to note, there is, and as you see, we've looked through a program, there's a huge amount on mobile across the conference. So we have a URL there, but I'd you know, recommend to everyone that they really look out and seek opportunities to learn more about providing mobile services at big conferences. There's a lot of expertise and knowledge around it in these few days that you can actually make a lot of use of. Okay, so that's very quickly mobile. I guess now we're open for questions if anyone has questions. Bert, this is for the first half of the talk. Will it seem the one that lives? Yes. Is it on the first part that's already done or the part that's being done? I didn't see it either. <laughs> okay, maybe it was left off the list. Samago <laughs> is on the list, um, or at least on our list. I may have inadvertently left it off the slide. It is part of the uh, continuing work that we hope to have wrapped up by the end of July. As you have tested this on all of the end, you've seen the experience of the work or just... Uh, not yet. Not uh, yet. Do you plan to do that? Yes. I'd be interested. Yeah, okay. yeah sure. Jim. So is, uh, let me see if I understand if I correctly, what you're really doing is you're creating um, uh, one of the products is a bunch of endpoints that folks can use uh, when they create a user Correct. So there's, there's no uh, um, UI, there's uh, part of this project. That is correct. Okay. That is correct. That's, that's part of what we're leaving to individual institutions uh, to deal with in the context of their own mobile app deployments, however they're doing that. And so in that, in that way, there is a similarity with mobile project because uh, um, you know the initial code was all about creating those uh, that API that could be used and then you know, used in a variety of ways. Um, but you also deliver the portal with this um, default web view 
Right. Uh, so right. Well, in the case of Kaitai, we don't deliver a default web view that's going to emerge out of, again, whatever app development or app purchasing. Because part of this was also not just to enable institutions that were building their own apps, but also to enable third party companies that are developing apps that want to sell apps and deliver apps to uh, their clients that, for whatever reasons, would prefer to buy an app rather than develop their own or don't have the resources to develop their own apps. So that was a key component of this, was to enable the app development wherever that may reside. Uh, do the, does the web service, is it basically, is it rewrite? So I mean, in theory, you could write an application that would take a Samago test, or is it just get the data out? It's intended to be rewrite. It's intended to be full functionality that when you engage the tools in a mobile device, you can do all aspects of those tools on the mobile device. Including the instructor side? Correct. There are obviously some interesting challenges associated with that. In fact, when you talk about testing, for example, one of the issues that we've been grappling with is a question of which um, uh, test would you necessarily want to deliver to a small form factor device in particular. Um, uh, you know, one of the use cases that at the University of Florida came out of a conversation with the College of Nursing is that they use a lot of large high resolution images in testing where their nursing students are involved with diagnosis based on what you can see in these images. And you know, you take a large scale image and you shrink it to a mobile device and suddenly you lose the resolution that enables you to diagnose. And of course if you're taking a large image and even you expand it to full size and you're sliding all over the image trying to find the piece that you need to look at. It simply doesn't work. So there are clearly going to be use cases of testing that are not amenable to a small form factor device. And that's one of the issues that we're now attempting to deal with. In fact, we're talking about putting an option in the test that would allow the instructor who's built a test to determine whether or not to deliver that particular test to small form factor devices. Going the other way, in the small, let's go to our smart television, smart TVs. Any application there? Um, not that I'm aware of. Again, it'll be up to the uh, how the devices choose to consume the looks that are built. Can I understand correctly that like the PDA portal that currently goes out once in God, so there will, will there be any changes immediately to that? Any any of this will be automatic, or does the school have to build stuff? Get up on the UI side. There is no intent in the short run to make any changes to the way the PDA portal um, is in Sakai, and Michigan has recently picked that up and begun doing some more development. Right now, those two projects, Kaitai and the Michigan development of that PDA portal, are separate projects. Um, we have had some preliminary conversations about uh, the possibilities of merging in some point at farther you know, farther down the road, but at this point they're still independent, so the PDA portal will continue to exist and continue to function. Um, that's a good question. It will be available in 2.10, um, but as I mentioned, I'm in conversations with Neil Caton and the 2.9 development process to see if we can bundle everything for a 2.9 point X point release farther down the road. There was a workshop on Sunday morning, actually, on that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, whenever you're developing Portless, any type of content, um, uh, you always win if you choose a responsive approach. Uh, because the, the fact of the matter, whether you're working in Sakai or you're working in Portal, um, you have tiny boxes. That's how I see it. Okay, the tiny spaces. Um, if you're on a dashboard view, unless unless someone goes and focuses that and uh, gets an extended view, you're limited in space. And then again, you know, uh, users might you know want to condense and expand the browser. So if you are if you from the beginning have a responsive design approach, your content will always render properly in any context in which it's uh, rendered. Okay. Yeah, that sounds really valuable, actually. I am doing a lightning talk on responsive design. I mean, it's only like, like five to ten minutes, but 
<laughs> it's up four. I think it's up four. Maybe just a small comment. Are they? I mean, I, I guess that for the, the 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 small screen, the idea is to really minimize the number of clicks. And we've been working on trying to merge the uh, people self information with Sakai information, because what you, what you want to give to the student is not like a, a menu where he clicks where. Right, the courses, and he clicks uh, this one, and then he clicks uh, well the week, and then the tool, and then eventually, I mean, it's it's going to be endless. So th there's a kind of uh, sort of reconceptualization. Uh, I mean, you have to sort of integrate the information, and we have done some work about that, and it's to sort of present at where I, I'm at the uh, in Montreal. So it, it, you have to sort of merge information coming from the the portal or the SIS and the from Sakai, so to give the students a better uh, UI because it's going to be really hard. The students wants to know exactly, wants to know, exactly, I mean, where am I going now? And where is the course? And what's what's what I what I have to do? Right? So this is a real challenge. Yeah, and I think so. You mobile providing that personalized view is a great first step with that. But as you said, you still got to do all the integration work and provide yeah. that personalized view across the day to do you. And that's going to be a challenge true. in the chat. It'll be a unique challenge to each institution. It's slightly different, but yeah. again, we can all learn from each other. I like to share that. But well, I think the, the web services are great. Yeah. yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, the delivery of the content is a is a challenge, and I'm delighted that we punted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dumb question. But what about bandwidth? Are there any concerns? Are we have a number of students that are Deployed in far off lands fighting wars that ought to take on forces, and they work from secure devices, handheld devices. Uh, is there bandwidth considerations? There are bandwidth considerations, obviously. One of the things that we've attempted to do in the process of the mobile enabling of Sakai is to focus on chunking data into small pieces. Um, so this increases the delivery uh, speed, it increases the integrity of the data as it flows to the devices. Um, uh, so that's a partial but not complete solution to that problem. I'm not sure there are any complete solutions to the problem of bandwidth, um, you know, ultimately. Um, but we have taken that into consideration, a lot of that work, and this is part of what Steve um, Swinsburg was alluding to in the slide that I had about um, that dealing with the data and data services in such a way as to maximize the speed with which data flows from Sakai to mobile devices. Right. Sure. Can we thank everyone then for coming to this point? I hope that's Absolutely. been helpful for you. And we're around for the rest of the week if you've got any other questions. And please, if you're interested in your mobile, come at one o'clock tomorrow to the public foundation. Okay, thank you. I know from, from the perspective of, the, of Project Kaitai that we have not addressed that again. As I've said, we've left the app development to institutions and, of course, to, to vendors, to third-party companies, Sakai commercial affiliates that are stepping into that space. And there are a couple of those um, that are stepping into that space that will be providing you know, that, that kind of tool that you can then purchase to adopt at your local institution. Um, one, of the, one of the kind of background conversations that we just be time to talk about um, in the context of this collaboration between myself and uh, the, the mobile group is the possibility of maybe building um, some of those generic hooks for institutions that use um, uh, Sakai. But there too, 
You know, there, there are complications with that. There's, of course, an awful lot of people that are using new mobile and not using Sky. Um, and you know, do you build in a capability that a lot of institutions aren't going to be consuming and yada, yada, yada. There are, you know, we've, we've just begun the, the process of even thinking about this, so let's talking systematically about that um, in a kind of collaboration. Thank <laughs> you.